Hello everyone and welcome to The Legend Makers. I'm your host Phil and with me today is special guest, my brother slash roommate. Over the course of these episodes, we're going to explore some popular stories we love and dive a little bit more deeply into the way that those stories can act as guides or tools for understanding the world around us. We're going to be drawing on a combo of philosophy, science, and religious thought to better explore those ideas. But at the end of the day, we don't really mean this to be an educational podcast. It's just for asking questions, starting interesting convos, and having fun. It's, it's strange how like 2014 does not feel that long ago, but 2017 feels like a long time ago. What happened in 2014? Well, because we just watched Interstellar last oh, night. Yeah. And so like, I, re I remember 2014 as being like, oh yeah, that's a reasonable amount of time ago that makes sense in my brain. But 2017 exists in a liminal space of, surely that was just last year, but actually it's like yeah. five years ago. <laughs> um, all right, so Wonder Woman. Okay, maybe, I mean, you could start with the basic plot. So basically, the Amazons were, and correct, this is the lore that the movie gives. I know absolutely nothing about DC Comics. The gods created this group of uh, super women who are called the Amazons, mm -hmm. and it was their sacred duty to protect the world, but then the world kind of sucked, so they escaped to this secluded magic island in the middle of paradise slash uh -huh. vaguely ancient Greece. And they live in like this utopian society. So then the gods gave the queen a child. A demigod? I know they call her a god. I think in this version, she's a demigod slash full god slash princess of the Amazons. Yeah, I think the, the idea is that I don't think Zeus and her mom actually got down to business. I oh, think no, no. Zeus just like gifted Hippo Queen Hippolyta with... A baby. Well, I think it's kind of like how in Greek mythology, Athena just kind of sprouted from Zeus's brain or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's immaculate conception, but yeah. with Zeus. Yeah, Diana is the DC version of a Greek god. But in this movie, she starts out not knowing that she is a god and not really yeah. knowing the full extent of her powers. Okay. She Little Mermaid style saves Chris Pine from... The, uh -huh. the ocean and then they go together Well, because his plane crashes on their island plane crashes on their island and then they go together to stop a well, fake version of world war one yeah the idea is diana believes that the reason why the world is at war is because Ares, the god of war has been corrupting mankind so she has to go kill Ares. but along the way many things happen and she realizes that mankind is not solely good but it is also not solely bad either and like fully corrupt. She basically starts the movie being told that man was good, Ares corrupted them, mm -hmm. and she thinks that as long as she kills Ares, it'll everything will everything be fixed. Everything will be fine. She realizes that things are worse than she thought, and then she realizes that Ares isn't what she thought, where he's not this kind of evil mastermind mm -hmm. who's forcing everyone to do things. He, the way he describes it, he's like the wind. Yeah. He's like the whispering. Yeah, he, well, he's, he's, I think he, Ares in this movie is supposed to be this is my interpretation, a representation of human evil and yeah. that sometimes human beings think of things that are truly reprehensible. He's, he's like that Kermit meme with the, the version the, of the, Yeah, the, the dark Kermit looking at Kermit meme where dark yeah. Kermit is like, do it. Yeah. And <laughs> Kermit is like, okay, he's I will do bad things. the voice in the back of your head yes. telling you to do bad things. Exactly. She, she leaves the island because she believes that, you know, it's the Amazon's sacred duty to protect the earth and she wants to fight for those who cannot fight for themselves, quote unquote. But she confuses literal fighting with the more symbolic conclusion she comes to at the end of the movie, where she is there to inspire humanity. You know, as I think this movie is a flawed <laughs> film, but perfect in my heart. <laughs> I, I love this movie for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> I mean, it's... It's one of those, when I first saw it in theaters, it's one of those movies that for absolutely no particularly explainable or quantifiable reason just had me feeling really emotional from beginning to end. That kind of emotional that you feel like right under the surface uh -huh. where you're not actually emotional, but you're just feeling something. It's, it just gets to you. As cheesy as it is and as goofy as like it has awkward pacing and its bad guys are all absurdly, absurdly <laughs> cartoonish. But all of that being a given, 
it's just so earnest and so sincere and it has a real depth of of heart and emotion that i think is entirely the acting like all of the acting in the movie and the, of course the writing the too. writing is 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 pretty decent but the writing all things considered is quite simple yeah and i think all the actors with the exception of the, the bad guys which are supposed to be cartoonish but all the protagonist actors just deliver such profoundly sincere performances yeah. like from the very beginning to the very end that the movie just gets you somewhere under your chest cavity in between your rib cage i did not think i would like it when i you remember there yeah. was one time we were like raking the leaves from the curb or something and we were talking about the fact that oh wonder woman is coming out and i distinctly remember saying yeah it's yeah. probably going to be bad and i was just really determined to dislike it and it completely blew me away not because again it was the perfect film but because it delivered the emotion and the message that i really value in my storytelling so this movie i think it has plenty of very strong scenes it's one of those movies that i can't really choose a favorite scene because it has maybe two or three really critical moments that make the movie and each of them is very strong but i have to say if i were to choose one scene that always you can pick as many as you want There's well no, no but but i i want to pick this one scene there is a moment after diana and the gang have liberated that village veld um so you have the no man's land sequence which is iconic and amazing they they get into the village and they save the village and then they have their cute yeah. you know she murders that one guy in the tower she, <laughs> mur <laughs> she totally wrecks that guy um, and then she and Steve have a ro their romantic evening. And then the next day, before the squad heads out to infiltrate uh -huh. Ludendorff's gala, yeah. there's this moment at the, in the very beginning where Steve is asking the gang if, if they're sure that they still want to go on this mission. And Charlie, who's their sharpshooter with PTSD, the, so Charlie says, well, maybe you're, you guys are better off without me. And there's this really sweet moment where... Diana pauses and goes, but Charlie, who will sing for us? Mm -hmm. And I think it just captures, it's such a small moment, but it, it captures, I think, the essence of Diana's arc throughout the movie of her developing this really tender emotional connection with human beings in all of their complicatedness and their flaws and yeah. their good and bad. Well, I think especially where, because when she first meets Charlie, she kind of She's has so a, unimpressed by yeah. him, yeah. And she's it's just it's such sort of a the opposite of what she was told men would be like yes and it's such a tender reflection of how she can uplift men right yeah. but also how they have taught her that they can be good and that they need that this love the the compassion this kindness that you show others is really important in mm -hmm. bringing out the potential in others yeah so that's my favorite scene i know it's not a very big scene it's like maybe five seconds long go ahead and say your favorite character just keep going i'll, I'll say all of mine in one <laughs> uh, well my favorite character is diana i mean th that's the point of the movie um no explanation we'll get into that no probably. explanation yeah i think that will come up later and uh, honestly favorite character relationship is Diana and everyone, I think, with with the exception of the bad guys, again. But, you know, Diana's relationship with humankind, which is represented through her relationship with Steve and her relationship with their, their little squad, and then also her relationship with every person that she encounters, you know, every rando that she sees and she is so effusively warm like towards. Like the ice cream man. Like the ice cream man and the, you know, the, the baby on the street and Edda and etc etc she she just has this etc et 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 uh, nice, nice. sorry <laughs> she just has this wonderfully effusive warmth with all these people she encounters and that just carries the movie though i do have to say i am you you know me you i am the most predictable consistent person in the world and it's okay this is we forgive this because it has a history. <laughs> but uh, Diana's, Diana and Steve's relationship Hailing is... back to the great year of 2009 when we first saw Star Trek. No, even before that. Oh, sorry, Princess Diaries 2. I, I was two. 13 when I saw Princess Diaries 2, the royal okay. engagement at a slumber party. But no, Diana's relationship with Steve, barring how dreamy 
Mr. Pine is in this particular role is very well done. I think it's writing wise, character wise, the crux of a large yeah. part of the movie where Steve represents both the good and the bad, like the tremendous potential for good and the potential for bad in man. And that there's a consistent dialectic between the two of yeah. them throughout the film. No, thematically, I do think that it's well done how their relationship carries the story. Mm -hmm. But I think even beyond that foundation, uh, just in terms of writing and dynamic and chemistry. Yes, I mean, their chemistry is amazing. I think amazing. it's pretty good. I yeah. think yeah I, we said they're while so we were watching, charming i said while we were watching they remind me a lot of uh rick o'connell and evelyn from the mummy even though yeah a those, little bit they're more fun and charming i think because of the style of the film mm -hmm. but the element of it that i think is similar to me is there's a writing trope that i saw a youtube video essay on a while ago about it's called born sexy yesterday or something like that oh yeah, I, yeah. i'm sure you've heard of it yes I and have. i think i think they do a good job in the movie of... I mean, I think Diana almost falls into it, but they do a good job of stopping her from falling yes, into it. Yes, I was going to talk about this, actually, that I, I really because, like... Yeah. Well, I, I'll just, I'll just say what it. I wanted to say, is because of the fact that her relationship with Steve does have elements of that, where he's kind of explaining to her the world, you mm -hmm. know, she sees the snow and she says, oh, it's beautiful or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the way that their characters interact fairly consistently has more of a quality of equal yes back and forth where she teaches him something yes. and he teaches her something yeah. and her perspective on the world is naive and innocent at first but it also has value it isn't as though and also her kind of falling in love with him isn't just because he's the first man she's yes. ever met yeah she meets other men too yeah but she their relationship actually develops properly to a certain yes. degree and I, and I really respect that the way I think that that interacts with um, the mummy in my mind at least is that in that movie Evelyn is kind of the classic like mousy uh, librarian like well she's a librarian but the, the point she's, in terms you know, of writing she's sheltered is, she's like in something like Romancing the Stone right there's, there's the classic Romancing the Stone exactly the strapping like survivalist <laughs> yeah with the man, crocodile boots with, with the, yeah with all the the swagger or whatever yes. or in like Jurassic World you have a lot of that yes, kind of yeah the woman the, the who's, dynamic who's yeah, yeah who's works as a secretary yes. or works in an office or whatever though arguably Jurassic and, World wasn't a terrible no I'm not saying it's bad this trope. I, exactly I'm just saying that trope has existed but what that movie manages to do very well is never make it feel like Rick is teaching Evelyn the ways of the world yes. and she's incompetent. Yes. She is very much very valuable and she and teaches very, a lot of him a lot yeah. of things. And it's much more of a back and forth. Yes. And I think this movie achieves that you, you, possibly even better. You fall in love with both of them yes. simultaneously as opposed to liking the way that one of them views the other. Like, yes. It doesn't feel like there's one pers perspective yes. that the movie takes where it's yeah. like, the man sees a beautiful woman or mm -hmm. the woman sees this really handsome strapping mm -hmm. man you see them kind of both as people who mm -hmm. meet each other and, and have a lot to offer each other in exactly. edifying each other's understanding of the very complicated world exactly exactly yeah it's well balanced yes. and i think this movie manages to do that i like that you brought this up because i was going to say in terms of favorite character thematically we're going to talk about diana later but maybe just in terms of how charming she is partially this is the writing partially gal gadot gives a really lovely performance i think she's just so extremely authentic and sincere about everything that Partially, it's the performance that sidesteps, avoids her falling into the that trope that you mentioned, that she's naive in a literal sense, but she's not by any means incompetent. She's very well-educated, very well-read, very knowledgeable. And her naivety at, you know, the fact that she's never seen snow before, or she doesn't know what dancing is, or she doesn't know what a watch is, or things like that. Yeah. Those are framed in the context of the story as things that, first of all, would make total sense for her not to know. But secondly, she reacts to them with such complete wonderment and, you know, genuineness mm -hmm. that it never makes you feel like, you know, how could she not know what this is? Ha ha, right? Yeah. It, it makes you feel excited to learn about these new things with her. Mm -hmm. And then also equally in the scenes where Diana reacts poorly to the bad elements of the human world where 
in a different circumstance, you might have thought, well, yeah, obviously that's the way it is. Why would it? you always feel as though Diana's reaction is a valid reaction because she's an objective outsider and she comes in and mm. she sees the mess that the human world is, both the good and the bad, and she reacts accordingly to both. Yeah. She reacts very positively and with so much wonder, wonderment and um, awe to the good yeah. things that humanity can produce. And she's also extremely horrified. At and all she, the yeah, she's things. extremely horrified and disgusted by all the terrible things. Mm -hmm. And as she matures over the course of the movie, both are, I think, more tempered. Yeah. And so she does not lose her her wonder and her love for humanity, nor does she compromise on her uh, disgust of the bad qualities. But she does marry them together in a more balanced position mm -hmm. um, that is wiser and and more mature. Yeah. The last thing I'll say, and this is a segue into my half of this section. Yes. <laughs> is I really do like the weird accent that the Amazons have. Yes, and I really like that too. I like, I don't know what Diana's accent is supposed to be. I think it's just Gavados. It's, I think it's, it's just, just Gavados' Gavados is really regular accent. accent. Yeah. yeah, which is fine. But as great as all of their accents are, everyone else's accents are so horrifically <laughs> terrible. It's so well, funny. Well, okay, pause. Wait, no, 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 let me finish, let me finish. So, what, who I'm talking about are all the Germans, yes. all the bad guys, yes. and that leads into my favorite <laughs> and my scene. So, for me, I absolutely love Ludendorff and the weirdo doctor, what, her name's Moreau, right? Uh, doctor, yeah, Isabel Moreau. Isabel Moreau. My god, they're so f I have to say this because it's not as though I don't have, it's not as though I don't have genuine feelings for the actual movie like yes. you i do but for me i always love the weird elements of any film and there are just so many funny elements ludendorff is set up as this big villain he's never really explained no. you never really get anything from him moreau is just this weird evil doctor and it works for the movie i don't think they needed to be complex in any way shape or form but I, what's his name? I think it's Danny Huston or something. Danny Houston. Danny Houston. Yeah, he's he's the main bad guy. Yes. And his German accent is one of the worst things I've yes, ever heard in my life. It's so bad. It's so terrible. Same with, I mean, Isabel Moreau's accent is less bad, but I don't even know if it's supposed to be German. We're we're not sure what that is. It's it's hilarious. I also and, really love her cackling laugh. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> so good. But in particular, just the fact that he, Ludendorff just shows up. Right. He's just the worst for no reason. Isn't he, just... he based on a real person in real, He's a real human person. history? <laughs> he was a real man. <laughs> <laughs> and then not only is his accent terrible, but like he's supposedly the one of the big German generals in yes, the army. But all he does but is hang out with his weirdo does, scientist friend. All he does is hang out with this scientist and do crack. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> just like every te every periodically every so often man snorts some crack and moves on with his, <laughs> with his day it's never explained <laughs> segues into your favorite my scene. favorite scene oh my god <laughs> <laughs> i have never seen i i need to calm down so i can say this without laughing so much there's a bit in the middle where he goes full villain mm. and he betrays his own people yes yes where he goes Classic. into the the german war room or whatever yeah where they're whatever ready, that's they're ready to, to sign the armistice or something which to to end the war and he doesn't want the war to end because he's evil um again never explained no so he essentially goes in and then this guy this german official once again terrible accent mm -hmm. he starts <laughs> haggling ludendorff about how oh you're the worst no one yeah. likes you and then out of nowhere he's <laughs> His accent kind of breaks, and he just goes, Ludendorff, enough! <laughs> and just, then continues talking. Exactly. It just comes out of nowhere. It's way louder than his normal speaking voice. Yeah. And it's just this super exaggerated. Yes. And then he goes Unmatched. back. And then it, it doesn't stop there. Ludendorff, he just kind of leaves, and then... Tosses a No, 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 no. The, the doctor on. comes in with this weird, like... Oh, yeah, her hat! Pork pie hat or something. <laughs> <laughs> she does this big flourish, throws in this gas bomb, and tosses it, and he tosses in a gas mask. They close the door, right? And then their accents once again kind of break <laughs> while they close the door. And she says, but the gas mask won't help. And he goes, they don't know that. And he does it in this weird, like, he does this weird chipmunk pose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then they start giggling like... Yeah, they, 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 they do the maniacal laugh. They, yeah, they do a maniacal laugh. 
they start giggling like children and then he snorts some crack. <laughs> so, okay, now that I'm composed, the point is, I love that scene. It's my favorite scene in the movie. Well, I think this is a good segue into talking about, so we want to do our arbitrary rating as per usual. Yeah. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about was that this movie is an excellent genre movie. And when I say genre movie, I mean there is a very particular genre of action-adventure fun-time film, which takes place in fake history, yeah. usually fake history being between 1917 like, to 1948, right? When does The Mummy take place? 1920s. Around the same time. It's around the same time as, as the... Because Rick okay. supposedly fought in World War One. Okay, yeah, yeah. But in... Uh, and when, does the Temp when is Temple of Doom? Is that in the 20s? Temple of Doom... You're, you mean Raiders of the Lost Ark? No, because Temple of Doom comes before. Temple of Doom is in the 30s, I think. Okay, so it's it's after. Yeah, but anyway... But it's in the same time Accordingly, yeah. you you know, all the, the movies that fall into this category, all the Indiana Jones... Captain America, the, the first, first Avenger, Avenger, the Mummy, Mummy, and Wonder Woman, apparently. And all what they have in common is a fun, stylized period setting, zero historical accuracy, and oftentimes very cartoonish German villains. Yeah. And I think Wonder Woman is especially hilarious because it's cartoon Germans aren't even cartoon Nazis. They're just cartoon Germans, even though in World War One. Germany was not the only bad guy, but I have to say, genre-wise, it's both hilarious and also amazing. I think it, it just leans so hard into the cartoonish nature of its own genre that it makes it work. It pulls it yeah, off. Yeah, I think we were talking about this yesterday. The movie, in terms of its memeability, mm -hmm. the movie doesn't have many particular lines that are funny enough yes. to kind of be memed yes but it, it is overall it does kind of not take itself too seriously yes. not even just Ludendorff yeah I forgot oh. <laughs> shout out to David Thewlis who ends up being Ares and I kind of quite like Ares from the comics, the comics I like yeah. his I, I have no horse in the comics accuracy race I haven't really but... read but I've, I've seen him in different uh other medias and he's quite fun as a villain i think mm -hmm. i like his big armor and his red mm -hmm, eyes mm -hmm. the ending scene of this movie is just absolutely ruined for me yeah i can't, I take, can't it take it seriously. seriously just because they keep david thewlis's old man head <laughs> but his body bulks up yes it, it, it and balloons he still has this kind of dorky little mustache yes. and he still has the same voice it's if if they had just put his helmet on and just given him like a like dark face with red eyes, like as for the comics, you could only yes. see his eyes. Yeah, that would have made it, would have been, it a lot more intimidating. It would have been so much more intimidating. But he just keeps this goofy mustache and David Thewlis's <laughs> face, and it's so funny. The the scene where Chris Pine right, does, puts on a fake puts on his fake German accent. Somehow his accent is really terrible, but Ludendorff's is still somehow worse. <laughs> That's just the magic of Chris Pine, baby. <laughs> But that bit where he puts on a fake German accent and tries to seduce a psychopath. <laughs> so in those elements, I'm saying very high memeability. I also think that, again, it pulls those elements off because its characters are so well realized. The movie does a really good job at fleshing itself out, even in a really minor, in, in really understated or moment to moment ways, before it hits the heavy handed moments of the only exception really being its completely unexplained Ludendorff side plot, which ultimately doesn't matter at all because it's so funny that, you know, why wouldn't you want to see that? So I think... Yeah, and Ludendorff ends up not even being the main villain anyway. Yeah, he just dies. Yeah. He snorts some crack and it just doesn't work <laughs> out for him and he dies. <laughs> um, iconic moments... I think the movie is full of them. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think we've gone into most of the iconic moments at this point. Well, I think the action sequences are all really incredibly done, as stylized as they are. Um, they're all very engaging. 
I think... Uh, Maybe with the exception of the final scene, it's a little too CGI heavy. Yes, the final scene. But even with the final scene, all of Diana's moments, Diana's shots... Yeah, I'm mostly Diana's, talking about Aries. Diana's choreography is all really cool. Um, it The the way that the movie... The lasso. Yeah, the way that the movie frames and shoots it, the power of her, her fighting style is very obvious and palpable. Mm. Um, as I said, I really like... I, we were talking about this as we were watching the movie... Every shot where this the scenery is is darked out and you can just see the flashing gold of Diana's lasso is just so beautiful mm -hmm. and so cool. Yeah. I mean, I've watched this movie several times now, and oftentimes when you rewatch old movies, older movies where the CGI is a little bit janky or over heavy, sometimes the magic wears off after second, third, fourth rewatch. But still, for me, the scenes with Diana's lasso hold up and they are very cool. Mm -hmm. The bit where they're the moment where she charges the tank and just like runs into it for a yeah, moment yeah. and shakes it off and then picks it up yeah. it has a lot of good uh details i think in the action sequences yes i think they they present and contrast diana's just sheer strength um really well and they build it well over the course of the movie of her kind of not actually knowing the full extent of her strength yeah. at the beginning and slowly growing into it and learning on the go yeah not necessarily iconic moments, though it does capture several iconic moments, but the movie has very great continuity in terms of Steve paying attention to and learning about Diana as the movie progresses, um, which goes back into what you were talking about earlier, about how, how well done their dynamic is. But the attention to detail to Steve being able to observe learn and then log away for later things about how diana operates how she fights like when he's on the amazon's island at the beginning and he witnesses yeah. that sequence with uh antiope and the shield yeah yeah, yeah. and I then mean, he that's, that's very they, explicitly it's very explicit yeah. but it's a really great callback and um really important character that detail has a lot of fun elements like um, that for sure i mean speaking of iconic moments Every scene Robin Wright is in as General Antiope. General Antiope. <laughs> <laughs> um, but oh yeah, also we were gonna bring up the the general Star Wars vibes with the there. Are, there are many many prequel Ares is memes. very uh, Palpatine clone esque. At the yeah, end. good Diana, good. Do it. <laughs> Do it. Feel your anger. <laughs> Um, and I do, I do like the ending bit in terms of iconic action moments where Diana goes sad supernova after Steve dies mm -hmm. and just explodes through a whole legion of rando Germans. Um, <laughs> <All those guys. laughs> she murders so many people in this movie. We're going to talk for the rest of this episode. into the, Actually, we can just start now if you want, after you talk about wigs. <laughs> but uh, in terms of most of this episode is going to be about love, but just the fact that she kills so many <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in classic superhero movie fashion. Well, no, see, I think it's fair in the context of the movie because she does come from a very warlike culture. Yes. And the movie never tells you that she's not going to kill people. Like, yes. It isn't like Batman where it's... It's a little bit inconsistent. It, yeah, it supposedly doesn't Or kill Daredevil. People, or Daredevil or a lot of the... In this one, it's pretty clear she's okay with killing people. <laughs> I just find it very yes. funny because well, of the she's, themes. I think Diana has this very strict code where she's okay with straight up murdering people who are bad guys. And if someone is an innocent, then it's reprehensible. Yeah, no, I think, and exactly, that's what she learns over the course of the movie. That of, it's of, not as cut and dry as that. As she thinks, exactly. Yes. Um, so we talked about aesthetic. I think the movie is great in its fake period setting mm -hmm. um it's not necessarily historically accurate but i love the costumes i love i really the like set designs uh, i love the soldier outfits yes um, like the chief and i love Charlie all of their yes, the yeah. squads the the squads of, i mean i love the squad in general even though they're not technically three-dimensional characters they all feel three-dimensional in this few moments of dialogue and just their presence on screen I mean, a good comparison would be the first Captain America um, as a good other example of this kind of movie, of, of genre sort of movie, similar, right? Yeah. They, they have a lot of similar structural beats, right? And mm -hmm. if you look at the squad, like Diana's Although, homies... Although, I have to say, the German yeah. accents are a lot more believable. Yes, the German <laughs> accents in Captain America are slightly better. 
Um, but I think if you look at, for example, Diana's squad in this movie yeah. versus the Howling Commandos Way in better. Captain America, the Howling Commandos are just there. You know, they, they, they just kind fair, of exist. I mean, they, they're not actually supposed to be characters. They no, barely exist. I know, but yeah. I think that the lack of their presence detracts from the movie as a whole. Whereas in of this, course. the presence, the, the character, the flavor, the flair of Chief Sammy and Charlie um, in addition to Steve, really elevates the movie and ties a lot of a lot of Diana's own arc together. Soundtrack wise, soundtrack wise, I mean, we we said the last time everything that manifests out of Hans Zimmer's big brain. Well, that's <laughs> well, in, with it, reference to the main theme, the Wonder Woman theme, the da na 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 na. That is Hans Zimmer, and then Rupert Gregson Williams really beautifully adapted that into a full soundtrack. Which, I, I quite like the soundtrack. I love the soundtrack. I mentioned before, it's one of those soundtracks that um, is not overtly emotional, but just makes me feel things every time I listen to it. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a viscerality that I really appreciate. Okay, and, genuine question Yes. Here. Because I am un- unknowledgeable, and you, the master, must yes. bequeath me with wisdom. Okay. That's Gal Gadot's real hair, I'm assuming. I don't know, actually. I spent the entirety of our re- rewatch this time thinking about it, and I think that it is extensions. What? It has to be her I hair. think that when it's tied back in the beginning, it's... Oh. It, d- 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 there's a difference between her mean. looks when the hair is tied up and tied back, and when it's down, like the long flowing locks of yeah. Diana. I think those are extensions. Maybe not a wig, but it definitely mm-hmm. it has a an element of overstyled to it that makes me feel like mm. it's an extension. I don't know this for sure. I'm just well, imagining mean, it. Clearly Chris but, Pine is wearing a wig. <laughs> no, okay, but I was going to say she looks really great anyway. Also again on aesthetic. No man can have hair that good. Hang on, hang on, hang on. We're getting there. We're getting there. Her her costume in general, I think they did a really good job at re-realizing the traditional Wonder Woman getup in armor. They set the precedent for it for the Amazon's type of clothing and armor really well, and it blended seamlessly into that. Oh, I do love her sword that. design. I love her sword design. I think her shield is really cool. But okay, so even if Diana is wearing a wig or extensions, this movie wins on the in the hair department because Chris Pine's hair in this movie unsurpassed. It's just the perfect length it just swoops so dreamily it i i can't explain i think it's a combination <laughs> i've been hearing about this man for as long I have, as i can you remember know, one just has to appreciate the fact that chris pine exists the intersection of his hair his turtleneck look the, 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 turtle the turtleneck neck. does look the really turtleneck good. looks so good i think whoever was in charge of that costuming decision also the big coat with the the um the fluffy, the, fluffy, the, the fur yeah. lining whoever was in charge of that that costuming choice god bless them intersecting with his character's personality which is great very ideal and then his performance man did not have to go so hard but he did and you know we love him for it so i think this movie deserves a solid Overall, I'd give it an 8. Yeah, I'd also give it an 8. Solid 8 out of 10. A disaster of a movie in many ways, but also the perfect movie in many other ways. So maybe having said all of that, let's talk about why I actually wanted to talk about this movie, not only because of the dreamy turtleneck. I think the main reason that I really wanted to talk about this movie is I wanted to ask the question, why should we love the world? Because Diana's whole stance at, by the end of the movie is that she it, she says it's not about deserve, so it's not about what other people deserve, but rather it's about what she believes in, what she stands for, and she believes in love. And so she rejects the opportunity to abandon the universe for her own personal power or gain, and not even power or gain, for her own personal ease of mind. You know, she goes through so much emotionally over the course of the film, and by all accounts, it would be much easier for her to just wash her hands of the whole thing and go along with what Ares says or what her mother said at the beginning of the movie, which is that mankind is corrupt, 
it is full of flaws, is constantly, you know, harming itself and each other. And Diana says, it's not about deserve, it's about what you believe, and I believe in love. And then further down the line, at the very end of the movie, she comes to the conclusion that within each person, there's this choice between light and dark, and no hero, or no god, or no um, super being, right, like herself, can make that choice of goodness for the world. Rather, only love that she says she believes in can truly save the world. She she makes that statement. That's her thesis. Only love can truly save the world. Me meaning that uh, you have to spread the choice as opposed to making it for people. But the question that I wanted to ask was, does this hold any water? In the Lord of the Rings episode, we talk about tapping into attributes of reality that are, I guess, in coherence with the logic of the universe, one of them being love. And so I thought that this was a really great opportunity to expand on that. Why should we love the world? Is Diana right? Or is it just a feel-goody statement of, you know, the power of love was going to save mankind? Mm -hmm. There's this concept um, that has been discussed in a multitude of different fields of the interconnectedness of the universe or of humanity or of both. This is one of those ideas that has, in recent years, I found been popularized in a sense where people, again, talk about it in feel-good terms. So unless you're, you're in the other camp of, well, the world sucks, everyone sucks, everyone just hates each other, you know, there's so much division and discord and humanity is in shambles and blah, 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 blah. You know, there are people in the opposite camp where it's become more more popular and more hopeful or positive to talk about how human beings need each other to survive. Um, we are designed to live in communities and work together and you know, nobody should be alone. And uh, as much as the circumstances of the world right now have made it such that that is increasingly difficult, people like to take the position that capitalism is evil because it's destroyed that and corporations are evil because they've destroyed that and our current way of life you know is not healthy for humanity because human beings need togetherness and they're all connected right yeah but the, the classic we are social animals yeah welcome. the classic we are social animals take now i'm not disagreeing with that my point here is that i think it definitely bears diving more deeply into and pulling apart as much as we can as to a is that really true? And B, what are the implications of that for this idea, for our behavior, and also as related to the love that Diana talks about? The concept of the interconnectedness of humanity. If I could actually just yes. jump in before we get into that. I think the, the premise that we're starting here, just yes. to be clear, is that this kind of social perspective on love and human interaction mm -hmm is a very common starting point yes but i don't think that either of us believe that it's uh it's enough to really justify the thesis of the film yes and i'm going to talk about that in a bit yeah so the concept of the interconnectedness of humanity is something that has been discussed um in ecological sense, so in terms of ecosystems and the natural world, it's been discussed psychologically in terms of consciousness and um, entanglement of human consciousness. It's been discussed from a spiritual or religious perspective, like a, in a metaphysical sense, which is also in the some ways... The sociological one is also the one we just The sociological up. one, economic, um, economic uh, and also from a physics perspective, from a, a more abstract perspective of the mathematical logic of the universe, this has also been discussed. So some really interesting quotes that highlight this. This one is from Werner Heisenberg, the guy who came up with the Heisenberg principle. The, He's, the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle, German physicist, winner of the Nobel Prize, etc., etc. He said that, quote, there is a fundamental error in separating the parts from the whole, the mistake of atomizing what should not be atomized. Unity and complementarity constitute reality. Now, similarly, authors Stark and Washburn, who were psychologists, I think, say, quote, 
The true wonder of the world is available everywhere, in the minutest parts of our bodies, in the vast expanses of the cosmos, and in the intimate interconnectedness of all of these things. We are part of a finely balanced ecosystem in which interdependency goes hand in hand with individuation. We are all individuals, but we are also parts of a greater whole, united in something vast and beautiful beyond description. Physicist David Bohm actually discusses the interconnectedness of human thought, as in addition to all of these other things, where he characterizes thought as a system of multiple intersecting human parts, both more abstract in terms of the information and also in terms of the lived experience and the emotion and the context. And, and it's, it's pretty much inescapable by the individual, according to Bohm. We can sometimes metacognize or reflect on our position in the system of thought, but we cannot exist independent of that system that is basically connected to every other human being in the world as a result of how thought has developed over the centuries. So, so just to clarify, so I can understand what mm -hmm. you're saying here. From what I understand, there can sort of be simplified to two different layers of interconnectedness. One is a very physical sort of interconnectedness mm -hmm. where you have, I don't know, a tree mm -hmm. putting out oxygen, which connects to us, connects to the whole world or whatever, right? The, that kind of physical sense. Or you have very economic, like regulations, laws, right. free po trade, pollution, yeah. trade, all that kind of interconnectedness. You have social interconnectedness through media, mm -hmm. communication, families, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's all physical forms of interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. But then you're also discussing a deeper kind of, you said abstract in terms of thought. Yes. So for example, you have a sort of social consciousness, which is interconnected. Mm -hmm. A metaphoric or paradigmatic position of, that of, people take. Yeah, yeah. How people view, have, how they have a worldview which relates themselves to others. To everything else around which them. Which influences yeah. their behavior. Which influences and, their behavior. But the, but the thing with that is but that... But it, it's also in its... Sorry, go ahead. It's... That system exists on all levels, so it directly influences the physical systems, but it also influences the individual experience of everything, but it also exists in abstract metaphor because it's what we're thinking. So thought mm. becomes actualized, right? Yeah. But it also has latency. It, it, your thoughts de define your own mental state and exactly. your own experience exactly. of, of life. Yeah in terms of physics we don't we shouldn't go too deeply into this mm -hmm. but there is a quantum layer of entanglement mm -hmm. and connection you brought up human consciousness which is more and even more abstract version of interconnectedness mm -hmm. of of how human beings can be connected through non-physical means yes i mean i think this is something that we can talk about in a later episode but there is this i the theory of superstring theory, for example, that there are vibrations, I mean, I, my understanding of it is very rudimentary, but everything is connected and actualized through different frequencies of vibration of energy mm -hmm. throughout the world that are nigh imperceptible by mm -hmm. the physical human eye or any kind of empirical measuring tool, but that allow us to, from, from the perspective of human consciousness, you and I can have a connection, can have some kind of an entanglement, quote unquote, mm -hmm. that lasts beyond, far beyond our immediate interaction. So, yeah, I guess for, in a very basic sense, quantum entanglement has to do with connection between physical objects that goes beyond space and time, mm -hmm, essentially. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can link some rudimentary examples of this in the description below, yeah. because it is a vast concept, and I do really want to do a f more fleshed out episode yeah. on this later. It would be a bit difficult to get into the more science-y stuff now. Yes. But and we also are an expert. Yeah, we also are an expert. So all of this to say that there's a lot of evidence out there. I mean, you, you have things... Like, a good movie example of it is Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar. <laughs> but that, that really happens in the real it world. It is real, yeah. Where it's based on scientific ecological evidence, where you have systems of tree roots and the, the way that a fungus grows here is directly related to the position of a tree over there, is directly related to the levels of, of nitrogen in the soil, is directly related to um, how animals have evolved over time. So... I think that there's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that 
the interconnectedness of both the natural world and the social human world and a more metaphysical connection between both humans and each other and humans in the natural world exists. Its details remain a little bit murky, again, because of the vastness of it as a topic and the complexity of it. But from that, how, how are we going to connect this back to love? Accepting that there is precedent for interconnectedness of all things, there is also theory or philosophical thought throughout history, especially of the more spiritual or religious form, suggesting that humanity is all connected, not just arbitrarily, but at a point of oneness. At some, there is some centrifugal force or... I'm not sure if that's what centrifugal force is. Central force is what you want to say. No, centrifugal, because it, like, centrifugal centralizes everything. Oh, I guess that still works. Yeah, it still works. Sorry, I thought you were... Yeah, okay, go ahead. So, okay, let's call it central. There is some central force that, that is the manifestation point of that connection. Mm -hmm. It is the thing uniting all of the other things that it encompasses. I mean, a famous Persian poet, so to quote a famous Persian poet, Sadi, he said, all human beings are members of the same body created from one essence. If fate brings suffering to one member, the others cannot stay at rest. You who remain indifferent to the burden of pain of others do not deserve to be called human. This idea of created from one essence, right, connected to one point of oneness, is present in a number of other religions to date, even ones that you might not, that you, you might think surely not because of how you've perceived them throughout history or in media. So, for example, from Buddhism, you see something like, quote, all things originate from one essence, develop according to one law, and destined to one aim. Um, in Christianity, it says, quote, God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought together in complete unity. And in Islam, it says, quote, all creatures are the family of God. Now, so I, the point here is just to be clear, is to bring up this issue that interconnectedness also it can be thought of in a more abstract sense, mm -hmm. in a deeper sense, as being an inherent oneness between mm -hmm. things. In, in our case, between human beings. Between human beings and I think... Of course, the rest of the world too, but in particularly with respect to what we're talking about. Yes. Um, and or, I what think we're focusing on emphasizing. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean many of these passages bring up the concept of God in order for it not to get confusing because often there are preconceived notions of God capital G. We can just think about it in terms of some kind of central uniting force or or will mm -hmm. that is you know potentially explained by the scientific and um, yeah. ecological and phys you know ph physical mathematical precedent for interconnectedness in the, the natural world. Mm -hmm. I, I think maybe what we can do, just so that we don't get into that whole discussion, there are places where God has been described as love. Mm -hmm. And I think that although it's probably not as simple as that, mm -hmm. For the discussion that we're having today, that's sort of the point that we're yes. trying to get to. Yeah, and of, I, I think we're going to elaborate on it yes, in a bit. Yeah, I, of of the important key unifying force here, this point of oneness or this essence being some sort of uh, deeper power mm -hmm. that we can refer to as mm -hmm. love, as being a connecting force between mm -hmm, all things mm -hmm. that we can then tap into, as was discussed in the Lord of the Rings episode. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so let's say we accept this thesis that exists in physics, ecology, psychology, philosophy, the arts. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel kind of fuzzy inside, right? You know, oh, we are we are all one. We are all united at, in this, you know, mm -hmm. deep, profound sense, etc. But... If I can just jump in. I think when you say that, the first thing that comes to mind for me is many people mm -hmm. would, would not agree with that. And I think the reason for that is many people would think that 
all of these different versions mm-hmm. of this idea of connectedness are all very distinct and separate. People would interpret love or uh, connection in more materialistic ways Mm -hmm. and ignore other elements Mm -hmm. or they would focus only on very abstract kind of wishy-washy and ignore obvious uh social and material conflict exactly so i think i think the key here is when we when we get into this issue of what are we talking about exactly it's not Mm -hmm. just a fuzzy feeling yeah The, the point is we're emphasizing the common theme through all human experience Mm -hmm. and study of the natural world Mm -hmm. which is this power of coming together Mm -hmm. where it isn't a necessary attribute we don't we don't see the world in its component parts Mm -hmm. at its face value right Mm -hmm. if you look at trees or a solid object here and there on its surface it isn't apparent Mm -hmm. that these things have such deep connection or Mm -hmm. that human beings can have such deep connection Mm -hmm. But you always consistently in different fields and in different study encounter it. encounter yes. this this necessity of things to come together mm-hmm. and to become something more. Mm-hmm. Well, I think this transitions well into the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which is that this coming together, this point of connection, right? Even if it is true, how how do we? Because as you said, some people like to think about it in terms of of pure abstraction or of the fuzzy feeling right Mm -hmm. because it it does feel good but they don't consider the true profundity of its implications not just for how we think about things but it if if it is true it has very serious implications for how we interact with one another how we design our systems how we you know operate socially how we operate nationally how we operate economically environmentally um personally on an individual level our relationship with ourselves it makes me think of there's this one um paragraph uh in the writings of the baha'i faith that i've always found extremely powerful and thought-provoking on this concept of the principle of the oneness of mankind or the interconnectedness of mankind it says The principle of the oneness of mankind is no mere outburst of ignorant emotionalism or an expression of vague and pious hope. Its appeal is not to be merely identified with a reawakening of the spirit of brotherhood and goodwill among men, nor does it aim solely at the fostering of harmonious cooperation among individual peoples and nations. Its implications are deeper Its message is applicable not only to the individual, but concerns itself primarily with the nature of those essential relationships that must bind all the states and nations as members of one human family. It does not constitute merely the enunciation of an ideal. It implies an organic change in the structure of present day society, a change such as the world has not yet experienced. Now, this was written, I think, in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, I don't know exactly. It it was around that time. It was around that time. And I think that it remains true today in its approach to this principle, its take on how philosophically profound this principle can go. Maybe what we can do is uh, break it down more in terms of how we understand because I think we gave a pretty solid explanation of all the different forms of interconnectedness mm-hmm. that have been observed and discussed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in this case, what we're really talking about is the core of what it means in terms of how we conceptualize all mm-hmm. of those different versions of interconnectedness. Exactly. Because you will oftentimes see people with, with full goodwill they, mm-hmm. they mean very well mm-hmm. most people mean very well uh discuss issues of oneness and unity and connectedness and love um very much in terms of kindness or uh being nice to one another mm-hmm. or trying to kind of encourage people to play nice or to uh tolerate one another or to not cause conflict to, to stop the fighting to not not have war Mm -hmm. there are many different ways that it's been appealed to for Mm -hmm. for many years 
And fundamentally, I think, not that there's a problem with that because it's very admirable. Fundamentally, it almost isn't enough of a, it doesn't have enough depth in its analysis of what really needs to change. Yes. Well, it also doesn't answer the question why. Mm -hmm. I think what this quote brings to mind or what this quote implies or carries implicit within it is that the the principle of, of the oneness of mankind or the interconnectedness of the world is the answer of why to why we should change the way that we behave to one another, why we should change our structures, why we should change. Um, it, it The quote both establishes that by saying that things are interconnected, it, it has much deeper implications for how we behave. And it also offers that as the reason why we should be, be changing things, we should be transforming things, we should be existing in brotherhood and fellowship and companionship, which is, I think, often, as you said, colloquially, we ask this question of what do we owe to each other? And often the discussion is around the fact that like you watch a show like The Good Place, which is an excellent show, right? It brings up a lot of really great questions, but ultimately it's what it presents is that, you know, we should be kind to one another, we should show compassion to one another, we should be forgiving and humble and work toward to, with each other in loving ways because we all grow together as a result. Mm -hmm. But that's a bit of a circular answer to the question why, mm -hmm. right? There's, so, okay, we all grow together as a result, but that doesn't explain why we all grow together as a result. And I think this issue of interconnectedness does explain why. You see this a lot, I think, in the discussions around human rights, mm -hmm. uh, especially online or in social media, mm -hmm. where human beings are defined as the human species. And within that definition, the logic is we should all be considered equal under mm -hmm. the law, mm -hmm. right? It's a very kind of social approach to trying to guarantee people opportunity and livelihood as, as it should be. Yes. But oftentimes, that doesn't seem to me as being uh, with foundation. Uh, it doesn't really give a reason for someone who has the affordance mm -hmm. to not help someone else to actually change their ways. It doesn't, it doesn't give a, quite a universal enough yes. incentive think... on an internal level from a, from a person's own perception of the world. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, many times it's talked about how human beings are selfish and they only care about others when it affects them in a way that you'll extend. I think the the research shows that people are only capable of having active friendships with like 100 people mm. at a time or something like that. Um, and that that's beyond a certain few degrees of separation. You can't, you can't care about others. You can't care about yeah. others. That's been brought up many times. And I think that that's true within the parameters of that humanist approach where, yes, people will, people who believe in that will be nice. They can be good people. They can do good things. Mm -hmm. But their viewpoint will still be limited because mm -hmm. often well, fundamentally you're, you're bounded it's you bounded rationality exactly. you, you don't you're not omniscient our, our brains can't operate on that you just can't level. handle it exactly and i think people will oftentimes i mean i study economics and people in the west especially where we live their conception of fixing the world is still very much centered on things that they're aware of and yes. things that they see when in reality a lot of the way that we are afforded to live in these countries mm -hmm comes at the expense of a lot of suffering in yeah. the rest of the world that we yeah. just never see, we never think about, we never experience. And it's very difficult to really understand what it would mean mm -hmm. to... Completely transform. To completely transform the world for the sake of others. Yes. Right? I mean, I, I think that's why so much of modern social justice has just become event to event. The, the, because it's, the it's thing so that... hard for people's minds to... Uh, extend empathy yes. on a human level, right? Where I put myself in your shoes. Yes. You can't extend that to everyone in the world. It's yes. so difficult. So people really need 
a deeper, more philosophical foundation justification yes. for why on a principal level, whether you're dying tomorrow or you've just been born and you mm -hmm. have your whole life ahead of you, mm -hmm. why your approach to life and others should always be a complete selfless love yes. that comes from within as opposed to coming from a social justification for yes. cooperation. Yes. Um, and I think it also sets precedent for understanding why so much suffering exists because if our systems, if the way that we operate is are not informed by this principle of interconnectedness, in fact, they are actively fragmented and actively disregard, what was it that Saidi said, that he talked about how um, if fate brings suffering to one member, the others cannot stay at rest, you will all feel it, right? You're members of the same body. Mm -hmm. well, and what I'm it, saying is that that's not physical interconnectedness. What no, he's talking yeah, about what he's talking about is, is not the kind of social responsibility and interaction where one tree connects to another tree or we're, we're polluting the earth and that affects other people. Because he's wrong on, on that level, yeah. right? On that level, that statement isn't true. Yeah. If someone is hurt on the other side of the world, I'm never even made aware of it. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. I can't feel it. I don't even feel yeah. it through the extension of my relationships yeah. to others. Yeah, which is right. why you have so many calls to action online that are like, I can't believe no one is talking about this. Well, because they're, they're literally like it's happening on the other side of the world. Well, it's exactly. No matter how much you try, yeah. that the ability to embed within a system the conditions so that mm -hmm. that is automatically being addressed yes. by the world you live in. Yes. Right? Where... where the system is set up to prevent mm -hmm. the harm of others mm -hmm. that you may never be made aware of. Yes. Right? To your expense. You yes. may not know how you're helping others. Yes. Right? But you're, you're still... Being... Part of a system that is exactly. designed to help others. That it doesn't come from this kind of physical sense that, oh, if I, I feel pain, you feel pain. That's yes. empathy. Yes. Right? That's me putting myself in your shoes and saying, mm -hmm. oh, I feel your pain. Mm -hmm. But... If I can't even see you, I don't know about your pain. Mm -hmm. That's what Sadi is talking about. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the fact that when one's essence is attached to the essence of everyone else mm -hmm. in the world, right, implicitly, in mm -hmm. your, inside your own heart of hearts, mm -hmm. right, then you can uh, achieve a kind of transformation when everyone mm -hmm. believes in that, when everyone mm -hmm. uh, strongly holds that. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this issue of where that comes from, because... That's a, that sounds very idealistic, mm -hmm. uh, goes a lot more into the issues of metaphysics mm -hmm. that we brought up earlier. But like we said, I think it's, it's good enough to just leave it as being a force for connection, like love, mm -hmm. to label it as such. Well, right? Where, where when, in the movie, Wonder Woman says, I believe in love. Mm -hmm. I believe that love can save the world. The way I interpret that is more along the lines of it being... A force of connection mm -hmm. which is primary and yes. then the, the, the kindness and physical manifestation of love that you show to the people in your vicinity mm -hmm. is a physical demonstration of that principle that you is, engage with that principle, that principle you are is, coherent with that universal principle yes. and that slowly brings things into alignment such that there is less suffering mm -hmm. but the less principle always comes first within you yes. right? that's the primary orientation of your actions mm -hmm. and thoughts about everything. Well, I also think that this issue of building structures, the implications of this go back to Wonder Woman's first point where she says it's not about what you deserve, which is what Steve originally brings up. Um, that the, the truth of this premise means that we have to build systems that encompass love, equity, justice, brotherhood, regardless of what other people have done, who they are, how they have or have not hurt you or others, a system that, like a true system that embodies the principle of human rights, it's universal, point blank. It covers, philosophically speaking, it covers everyone. And by extension, it means that your attitude towards everyone should be aligned with that. It, like philosophically it's a universal principle by mm -hmm. definition it has to be or it will f inevitably fall mm -hmm. apart and I think because of its internal inconsistency what, no and what which you see here... in the world right now because people want to 
promote human mm -hmm. rights, but nothing is designed in coherence with the principles that actually inform human rights, philosophically speaking. The world has to operate, in, and by the world, I mean reality, mm -hmm, I mean mm -hmm. existence. Yeah. If, if we accept that it operates according to love, according to a force of connection, mm -hmm. then when an individual or this, this institutions of society don't embody that principle in their design, right? That's when chaos and conflict arise. Mm -hmm. They arise because there's this clash yes. against what the, the world... The tension. Exactly. Between the, the way that things are meant to operate... To operate. And the way that they the way have that... been implemented and are operating. Exactly. Yes. And I don't think that this means, this kind of love and connection that we're talking about, means that nothing bad ever happens to anyone. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at nature as kind of the original system of balance, mm -hmm. right? There is still entropy and decay, mm -hmm. but it all is in cycles, mm -hmm. right? It's all in a feedback loop of balance mm -hmm. where energy isn't created or destroyed. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just in its states of matter, it changes, it moves from one yes. to another. And I think... Which goes it, back to you catastrophe, right? Exactly. I think if we think about this, that as being love, as being a force which binds things together mm -hmm. and wants things to uh, exist in a state of uh, connection, right? So what I'm talking about here is the, ne the necessary relationships between all things. In a very literal sense, you can interpret, I don't know, a predator eating prey mm -hmm. and killing it as an act of physical violence. Mm -hmm. But on a higher level, I think you can interpret that as being a necessary and connection and relationship between the predator species and mm -hmm. the prey species, mm -hmm. right? The predator species relies on the prey species' existence, mm -hmm. just as the prey species relies on the plant life that mm -hmm. they consume. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and, and all of that ties back in because when the predator dies and decomposes, they feed back into uh, the, the plant the plants, life, the, the plants mineral, in the yeah. system. So it's not that there's a physical level of perfect harmony where no and one utopia, ever harms anyone. Yeah. It's not necessarily a utopian ideal, but what it means is that our perspective on the world and existence mm -hmm. is that we want to align ourselves with connection and growth and sustainability mm -hmm. and like like we talked about the right of all human beings to exist harmoniously mm -hmm. with the world. Yeah, right. well, I think that also aligns with what takes place in Wonder Woman the movie where the the point is to reduce human evil, human suffering, human corruption, not to reduce like an abstract ebb and flow of the natural world that just, you know, happen there death happens, you know, old age happens, disease happens, right? But but rather Diana's issue, her whole crisis of faith is in human capacity for evil, human capacity for mm -hmm. incoherence, right? And for causing suffering and, and engaging in conflict and violence. Now, mm -hmm. okay, so that was a lot. Let's summarize for a second. So we love others because we are all connected to something greater than ourselves, a whole system. And to not love others is to contradict the fabric of the system and immediately cause chaos and conflict. It is also fundamentally if we accept the principle of interconnectedness, or even accept the principle that human beings deserve justice and equity, internally inconsistent to choose to love some people and not to love other people, mm -hmm. right? Again, it comes back to Diana's position where she loves the world, right? Mm -hmm. She loves everyone. She loves people she's never met because... And, and that, that doesn't mean that she doesn't have distaste for bad behavior yes. or bad action like yeah it doesn't mean that you forgive human sin yes. and, and terribleness right yes yeah you kind of touched on this you said that love is just that metaphysical force um but i think we can elaborate on that a little bit and i think that love is not only that metaphysical force and that there, uh, yeah, I mean, the, there is the relationship sense, yes and the there's sense. relationship between several levels of love because th this doesn't mean that, you know, we have to hold hands with the people responsible for decimation of entire ethnicities or starvation of children and like say, kumbaya, yay, we all love each other, right? Let's talk about levels of love. From, from what I've read, what we've encountered, you can say we have love in practice, 
with individuals around you, so your family, your friends, the stranger you meet on the street. Love as a theory that guides your attitude, behavior, and decision-making. So for example, the choice Diana makes to save a humanity who is at war, despite her distaste of the war, of their, their corrupt behavior. And love as a metaphysical force in the universe, which we've talked about a little bit. So in the movie, love is both an interpersonal force, right? The love Diana has for her family, for her mother, for Steve, for her comrades, right? And a power Diana harnesses or represents. I mean, there are multiple examples in the movie, right? Steve's thesis is that believing in love again via Diana's hopefulness, her idealism, her principles, um, is a redemptive moment in his life. It inspires him to be wholly selfless and do something... To find meaning and purpose. To, to find meaning and purpose by doing something for other people who he's never met before and doesn't necessarily know personally and don't necessarily, quote-unquote, deserve his action um, or his sacrifice, right? Diana's behavior towards the members of her little squad, so Sammy, Charlie, and Chief, acts as a healing force, right? So her interactions with Charlie, the, the scene that I mentioned at the beginning, right, where she's so kind towards him and so gentle, it uplifts him, it inspires him. And finally, Diana defeats Ares by believing in love. She has her moment where she like goes full supernova and like represents the awesome yeah. power of her, her godliness, like right? It's a very of literal it. representation of the, the power of love. So let's break this down. Love influences your decision making and also something that you carry out with other people, so fellowship, brotherhood. I think there's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. about the implications of that, of what it looks like. So he says, quote, Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all mankind. That all-embracing and unconditional love influences your the way that you think about and engage with people, not just of your own group, your own family, your own immediate circle, but throughout the world. And I think we've, we touched on this, but love in practice, right? What love looks like, if we want to talk about what that means. Being nice to someone is not the same as loving them and treating them as a human being. Um, in undergrad, I had a health promotion professor who specialized in a particular kind of uh, like health promotive therapy. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but she always said that she like drove this point home in lecture a hundred times that she said as a counselor in, you know, helping others to be their healthiest selves, kindness or love or compassion and niceness are two very different things and oftentimes we confuse the two and think that we have to be nice to people to preserve their feelings to you know make sure that we protect them from all bad things from we, we have to hold their hand through things right kindness and love fundamentally requires considering the best interests of the other person is what she would always say we can also describe love in its extended attributes. When you love something, you sacrifice for it, you want justice for it, you are compassionate towards it, um, you exercise forgiveness, trust, detachment from your position in relation to it, so back to the difference between love and niceness, right? Mercy, fellowship, kindness, etc. I wanted to bring up a very interesting discussion by author C.S. Lewis in his essay, um, the Four Types of Love, where he talks about two major forms of love. He says, I mean, he, he breaks it down into four, but his original premise is that there are two types of love. Gift love, or selfless love, and need love, or a pragmatic, quote-unquote, deserved love. I think 
This really helps us distinguish between the more abstract philosophical concept of love that we were talking about earlier and the social altruism that is often referred to as being the driving force of positive human interaction. Because Lewis says that need love is human beings needing to surround themselves with other loving and caring individuals for their own health, their own happiness, you know, cooperation. Um, yeah, it's a very kind of evolutionary necessary type yeah. That kind of social altruism. Social altruism. It's it's far it's a far more granular thing, right? Whereas gift love in his eyes is the all-encompassing thing, the one that occurs on principle. So Lewis, of course, approaches this from a Christian perspective, suggesting that God's love for humanity, as described in the Bible and indeed other religions, is the ultimate gift love. So there's no deserve at play there. God loves his creation selflessly and absolutely. And, and in his view, you mean he's saying that we should do the same. And he says as God that, does. yes, we should do the same as God does. So it's an interesting, to, uh, an interesting metaphor to think about, especially in the context of superhero stories and particularly in the context of Wonder Woman, where Diana yeah. is in the quote unquote God position, where she is. I mean, literally. Literally, yeah. but, you know, she is that point of view personified where she's this bastion of good and she's so like truly so wholesome right oh. and she has these godlike powers she really does not have to show mankind love but she does and i think that leads us to this issue of the power of love right diana represents and harnesses a very obvious visual representation of raw power that comes from her ability to love, her decision to transcend Aries' conclusion and Aries' position, partially from her love for Steve, her realization of how much she loved Steve and the fact that Steve, out of his love for her, was transformed, made that selfless sacrifice, mm -hmm. right? She, it kind of clicked for her that the same can be extended to all of humanity. Yeah. And so... Well, because it, it comes with a degree of forgiveness and coming together which is selfless in, in a sense where her her acceptance of steve came with understanding his failures mm -hmm. and not necessarily expecting him to stay the same mm -hmm. but but understands why it was meaningful for mm -hmm. her to have engaged with him the way that she did yes she yeah. understands what it did for him and also and what, what it did, did for, for her. herself yeah exactly not that uh, he was a perfect person mm -hmm. or that he needed to be, right? Mm -hmm. I, and I think that that brings us to, again, to this issue of the connective and cohesive power that, that love can be described as. Mm -hmm. as. As it wasn't just a kind of romantic love. It wasn't just a love of his charmingness. Yes, though it he was, was very charming. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a love, it's a love that has to do with to people uh, becoming something more in their yes, relationship. Yes, through, through their coming together, they, they tap into their full potential as mm -hmm. individuals, right? Yeah. Which is a really, really profound and, and beautiful representation of love, both of romantic love in an instance of it and also of what love can be for humanity. We, psychiatrist philosopher Dr. Ian McGilchrist, he's a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist um, and a literary scholar. Man is, he's done really great work on the difference between the left and right brain hemispheres from a neuroscientific perspective and not in the pop culture sense, but in the uh -huh. genuine science sense. He's like one of the leading experts in the world. His position is that Love is as an exper is an experience of a holistic perception of the world or wholeness that is associated with the functioning of our right hemisphere. So the, in, in his research, he talks about how the right brain hemisphere tends to see the world around us. It cohesives or makes coherent the different in independent parts that our left hemisphere engages and encounters with. So it gives everything wholeness or meaning, right? Mm -hmm. and it is predominantly through the right hemisphere that we experience love. Einstein said that he would always often talk about, and many physicists do, about many elements of human experience being an illusion. Mm -hmm. And in his case, he talks about separation 
from others as being an illusion. So he says that a person experiences life as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And he says that our task has to be to free ourselves from this self-imposed prison and through compassion find the reality of oneness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to be too much of a loser, but... We were watching Interstellar last we, night. Yeah, we rewatched Interstellar last night. And cried a lot. But uh, that movie, I think, does a great job at bringing up a very beautiful message about... Well, it represents this idea in a very unique and creative way of love being a metaphysical dimension yeah. that... It transcends that time and space. Transcends time and space, but is like profoundly fundamentally there and what binds us all together. Exactly. And in the movie, there is this fundamental love connection between mm -hmm. a man and his daughter across time and space, but also between each person and the rest of humanity. Right. Yeah. Right. It's. I mean, it's interesting because when Cooper is in the, the Tesseract space at the end of the movie, he and Tars are talking about who they is, who they is, the, the they, the beings that put the test. Yeah, yeah. In I place mean, I guess him. spoilers for Interstellar. Uh, we, we blanket statement. We spoil everything here. Yeah. But there are a few closed loops of this metaphysical connection at play, where one is the relationship between two individuals, right, a father and his daughter, but also the they that has placed that space there for him to tap into that relationship is human beings it's just human beings that he doesn't know exactly who they are and does not necessarily have a direct relationship with them but they represent the past slash future of a humanity mm -hmm. that is connected to him mm -hmm. as as being there to help guide and bring them together and to, to connect them to to unite them to save themselves mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. there's an, there's like we've talked about in lord of the rings there's this redemptive mm -hmm. new catastrophe there's this uh, coming together, which is mm -hmm. somehow transformative, both well, for individuals on, and also for collective. Groups. And also on Wonder Woman, right? Like yeah. back to Diana's like mm -hmm. final statement yeah. in the movie that she says that no external hero can come and make the choice for mankind. Exactly. It is mankind's choice to tap into that transformative power. Mm -hmm. And what you need to be doing as the hero mm -hmm. is spreading the understanding of the choice mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. like like what we said with interstellar how they are helping them they aren't mm -hmm. alone mm -hmm. right they help them come together mm -hmm, they help mm -hmm. them solve their problems but mm -hmm. it is a ultimately up to them to do it for themselves mm -hmm. right i think that's what you're saying with one woman what she says is that uh, love is the force that mm -hmm. saves people, mm -hmm. but it, it can only save them as long as they let it save them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? They have to choose to embrace it in order to save themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also think that that is a role that we cannot adopt without this a deeper understanding of some of the things that we've talked about here. Because if we adopt it arbitrarily or purely because it's a feel-good kind of a thing, then it can very quickly lead to even more incoherence and conflict because inevitably it will encounter th surface level things immediately obvious things that that run counter to it that so-called disprove it right disprove why i should show love to the person beside me because you know people are quote unquote undeserving mm -hmm. human beings are capable no, of very, terrible very things so, yeah, yeah. And, and yet, if, if your perception of love is to, you just have to push beyond it, yes. right? That's going to hit a wall. You yeah, don't it's have not sustainable. Emotional capacity to keep forgiving and to mm -hmm. keep ignoring things, yeah. right? People, you get burnt out yeah. of love yeah. in, in that kind in of that kind of, of love. It. Yeah, it's also not effective. Like pure, just forgiving things and not holding people accountable is not. It is not what I think the point here is at all. I think as we discussed in that the quote about the implications of the principle of oneness of mankind, right? We are holding each other accountable for the suffering we've caused by actively working to transform the systems that we exist within. If we adopt this philosophy, if we believe that love can save the mm -hmm. world. There's always more to talk about, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, the first thing that it starts with is oneself. Mm -hmm. 
and the choice one makes and then how one spreads that choice and helps others make it mm-hmm. and um i think right now there's a lot of conflict in the world there's a lot of uh love that is shown selectively yes. where if you are on my side or if you agree with me or if you are not bothering me at the moment i i will treat you nicely with dignity with um, respect but that that kind of principled internal unshakable love is something that transcends the sins of others it transcends it's unconditional exactly but it also is not unconditional in the sense that it leaves you vulnerable to well, being it, walked all over or hurt exactly and that's the thing is is that if you interpret it as being a very literal physical thing where you just have to constantly be nice to someone who's uh, torturing you mm-hmm. right or oppressing you or, oppressing or you. you know you're going to burn out of it because you have to understand a deeper perspective on it mm-hmm. and act accordingly now for now in a principled sense internally there's a first step that has to do with how you orient yourself towards humanity yes this is a good place to say Ludendorff, enough. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for listening. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, clarifications, please feel free to leave them in the comments. We would love to hear from you. We hope you tune in next time. Congrats yeah. on making it this far. <laughs> that was that was good. Very successful episode, but not enough crack. <laughs> <laughs>